start. So hello everyone. And this is an interview conducted for the Young Ambassador Program for the Environment Day. And today we have Jan Stewart with us. We're going to answer questions about sustainable emergency buildings. So hello Jan, nice to meet you. Hi there, hi Nina, thank you for inviting me. With pleasure. Uh, so can you first uh, introduce yourself? So who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so I'm Ian Stewart. I'm, I've, I've got two jobs at the moment, two hats on. Professor of Geoscience Communication at the University of Plymouth. So that involves uh, communicating geoscience to non-technical audiences. And my particular background is in geohazards. I'm an earthquake geologist by background. So quite a lot of my <clears throat> communication is in disaster risk. And then I've taken on a new role at the Royal Scientific Society in Jordan as their research chair, chair in sustainability. And again, that's gonna be broadly at the science society interface around variety of topics, uh, but disaster risk reduction will be, be one of them. So my interest really is about how we take complex knowledge about the science of, in this case, disasters, uh, and communicate that to those that need it. It could be the public communities, or it could be decision makers. Okay, great. So now when we talk about emergency buildings, uh, what do you have in mind? And sustainable, sorry, emergency buildings. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you see the image. I mean, I've, I've only been in a few post-disaster situations, and the thing that sticks in your head is the large tented encampments that tend to be be put up. Um, and, you know, there's various aid agencies that come in, some of them very, very specifically for, for the, the immediate post-disaster. So just in the last, in the days and in the, in the weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even locally in southwest England, we have a um, organization called Shelter Box that has a big green box, and that is essentially everything it needs to build a temporary house, yeah, house, tent, and everything else. But I think that you know, one of the questions really is the transition from mm -hmm. that emergency housing and then the part of the rebuilding recovery program where then you're wanting people to build but build in a more sustainable way and a more secure way. And I think that's an interesting transition that hasn't really been investigated much. People look at a lot of the emergency provision of housing, aid agencies and, um, or structural engineers or civil engineers look at the, you know, what kind of buildings would behave well in certain environments, but how you get from one to the other isn't, it's not very well looked at, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third question is, so for you, do you think um, this kind of building should be constructed um, linked to the disaster where they are located or uh, should that they also take into account future disaster that may occur with the global warming, for example? Well, of course they, sh they should take the second, but I think the reality will be, it will be the first. So I think one of the things that you, when you go to disaster zone, there's a real energy about rebuilding. And this comes from two places. The community wants to recover themselves. You know, there's a, in some cases, it's a psychological, we won't be beaten by mother nature, we will rebuild. And, and, and the, sometimes that's really important for the spirit of the community that they're seen as um, having an active role in rebuilding. The problem there, though, is that they tend to want to rebuild what was lost. Yeah. So their house or their school, or they want to rebuild it. And in some cases, very explicitly, they want to put it back exactly as it was mm. be because of this idea of not being beaten, being defeated by, by nature. Um, and then you've got a whole lot of engineers and civil engineers who have looked often, you know, you have these EFIT team, these emergency engineering teams that look at the damage and assess what type of building has withstood it very well, what the buildings have collapsed. And of course, from that comes recommendations about what you should and shouldn't do. Um, my anecdotal experience has been that the first one tends to win over the second one. Yeah. I remember being in uh, Thailand after the Boxing Day tsunami in 2005, well, it was 2006 I was there. And uh, oh, sorry, 2005, I was there. And um, 
you know, hotel owners whose whole complex had been completely destroyed by the tsunami were saying, um, I will rebuild, I will rebuild here, I will rebuild it exactly as it was, and this time next year, tourists will come, and they'll come here. <clears throat> and so that's quite depressing, because you realize there isn't the chance of evolving the knowledge of that. But the reality is, that is a piece of land they own. Um, they don't have the chance to go and buy some land somewhere else. Uh, the reality is the tourists want to live in that location by the beach. They don't want to live a kilometer in land up by where the lo local villages are. So everything pressures the decision to be more or less the easy option, because the other thing about the post disaster is maybe lots of aid comes in, a lot of energy for rebuilding, and so a lot of money, a lot of materials for rebuilding. You know, the houses have been destroyed, but the materials are still there, so you can just rebuild. And then a, and a kind of community of workforce where jobs have been stopped. And so there's lots of people, labor to do things. So there's a huge energy in those months to, to, to see this, the same infrastructure, the same buildings going back up. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Build Back Better ethos is very difficult because you're going against so many natural tendencies in the socioeconomic system that you know, thinking about this might happen again in another five years or 10 years, so we should do something differently. Well, that's five or 10 years. People are trying to survive now in the next six months, you know, so it's difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Really interesting. Um, my uh, fourth question is, uh, do you think there is also some negative impact maybe of constructing this building for the environment? Well, I think that's, I mean, I think, it depends on the nature of the disaster that's happened. But I think, for, for example, for an earthquake, uh, where you've got the building materials there, um, then I guess there's probably not as much effect if you're just putting them back up. Okay. If you've got um, a very different hazard, the volcanic eruption, some kind of pyroclastic density current or a, a lava flow that's destroyed a whole landscape, then you're creating everything from, from scratch. The, the dangers are that that rebuilding will require resources. So it could be wood from cutting down uh, trees, but it could also be things like water. So yeah. you need water and sand to make cement to start to do it. So there'll be a, a tremendous um, uh, use of resources. And of course, it's difficult in that post-disaster climate to say, be careful for the environment, you know? <laughs> because people are saying, well, you know, this is about us. This is about rebuilding a human community. We can't, who, who cares about the environment in the short term? Mm. I think the, the, the area of overlap is in, funnily enough, in sustainable buildings. Mm. So I think that we wait too long for the post-disaster. If we could start thinking around what makes sustainable, secure buildings in the, in the long term, then when a disaster strikes, it's a case of taking that as an opportunity to put into practice things that have been trialed and tested. So I don't think the, I don't think the post-disaster environment is the good place to experiment. Yeah. Because people's livelihoods and indeed lives are at stake. But I think it is an opportunity of change. There used to be this strange, weird thing in America where people, planners, urban planners on the East Coast, used to look lovingly at California because it had earthquakes, because earthquakes were disruptive. It forced the urban planners to constantly evolve and change and be dynamic. Whereas in the East Coast, when something was there, it stayed there and it, it was, if it wasn't fit for purpose, it just stayed. So disasters do offer this opportunity of turnover and change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a case of making sure that the sustainable buildings community, the research community or practice community, are connected into the disaster community so that in that, so that we can start to look at, and I'll give you an example, which is traditional building methods. Mm -hmm. So time and time again, what we find in many areas with hazards is that the traditional built buildings operate better, survive better. Not always, um, but, but what it means is that 
being able to, but often those lessons are lost on how to build traditionally and things. And we see there's example after example of a, an architectural feature that is being forgotten about and, and lost. And then people realize afterwards that that actually was really good for say earthquakes or for floods or something. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the lessons are not about new types of buildings, but going back to old ones. Now, you know, it's not always the case. And indeed, the reduction in death fatalities in disasters over the 20th century has been dramatic. It's largely been because broadly, we build better. Yeah. However, what we're now finding, of course, is that we're now putting millions of people into concrete apartment blocks that if they collapse, produce a huge death toll. So we've, we're, um, we've got ourselves into a problem. But by and large, we build structures that are broadly stronger and more competent in in most disasters and say and that's hence why the death toll has gone down so i think looking at my traditional materials and the, there's a big push now in sustainability anyway to look at traditional materials as a just a better building type anyway never mind the disaster so i think it's probably there you know encouraging that development and then in encouraging how that might be translated into the post-disaster or uh, after-disaster um, phase a bit more effectively. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think is an action that someone can take today, just right now, just after they watch this video, uh, this interview to help environment, for example? To help the environment? Uh, well, that's a good point. Um, what? Well, I guess the headlines are um, don't eat meat, um, don't have a kid, <laughs> don't fly, <laughs> and there's a lot of don'ts. Um, I think that, I, I, but you know, we know that those are all big elements in terms of things like that. So I'm, I'm having, I think the Catherine Hayhoe, the climate scientist, says that the most important thing you can do, and she's really talking about climate change, but I think it goes for the environment, is talk about it. <laughs> and I think that. You know, I think it is becoming more and more accepted as an everyday part of conversation to talk about climate change and environmental change and things like that. There's a, a consciousness, a public consciousness that's rising. So I think that the simplest thing is it's okay to talk about it. It's good to talk about it and to be bringing out your own particular area. Um, but at some point, we then have to get to the really difficult issues. And those are things like diet, our travel, the way we travel, the way we work, and these are much more fundamental questions. But until we've got a, a conversation going on in society about this, we're not going to get to those deeper ones. Okay, thank you very much for you. answering all my questions. <laughs>